Hi, so this is the second video in um, our, our series on dealing with the big questions. And I want to look a little bit at a phenomenon that happened about 15 years ago, and that was what is called the, the New Atheists that came onto the scene. And uh, they were a very interesting group of people. That has kind of fizzled out a little bit now. Uh, but for a while, that was uh, they brought talk about God into the mainstream. So it, it, they're worth talking about because there's still some of the, the after effects here. And uh, I had a systematic professor, a systematic theology professor in seminary who said, these are our friends. Because he said, well, one, that they were bringing these conversations into the open, but also that the God they are denying, we should deny too. <laughs> that they are not, they are talking about a vicious, spiteful, arrogant, uh, child-killing, vengeance, full of vengeance God. Uh, it was a, a cruel deity. And my systematic professor, he just said, yeah, that's not a God that we should believe in. So, and, and he Wright said something very similar too. He said that sometimes he'll bump into an atheist and he'll say, tell me about the God that you don't believe in. And they'll go on saying, well, I don't believe in this old man with a beard um, up in the sky, casting judgment down on people. And um, and N.T. Wright, uh, who's an Anglican bishop, uh, but also a New Testament scholar, and he, he would say, oh, well, I don't believe in that God either, <laughs> which usually threw people off. But it, it's worth it's worth saying that uh, we there's a lot we can agree on with the new atheists, that, uh, or atheists in general, who are not liking uh, a particular image of God, because we probably don't like that image either. Um, I've heard people like Robert Barron, Bishop Robert Barron, talk about how... Uh, he actually doesn't disagree very much with atheists on their view of God because they tend to see God as a being that exists inside the universe. And he says, I don't believe in a God that exists inside the universe. And uh, they tend to believe in a God who is, uh, again, vicious and all this kind of thing. He says, I just don't believe in that kind of a God. So he's on the same page. <laughs> and uh, I think that's, a, that's a, something we need to keep in mind, I think. One of the things that seemed to change the conversation, so uh, some of the new atheists would talked about how th this became important to them, speaking out against religion when 9-11 happened. So they believed that was an expression of religion. Uh, some jihadi terrorists, um, this is not saying anything about all Muslims, obviously, but there was a, a group of extremists who wanted to uh, do what they believed to be jihad, uh, holy war against the United States, and they flew planes into the World Trade Towers. And after that had happened, there were a number of people who said, we have to speak out against religion. Um, and so that's kind of seems to be what gave rise to these uh, these uh, new atheists. But ironically, it was actually Islam that also seemed to put a bad taste in society's mouth towards some of the new atheists. So there's uh, Sam Harris had a conversation on uh, the Bill Maher show, and he was on there with Ben Affleck, and they were talking, he was kind of going on about religion the way he had been going on quite uh, quite a lot towards Christians and talking about how Christians are are not very good people or that Christian worldview is not very rational and had bad ideas in it and and he's doing the same thing to Islam this time and uh, Ben Affleck just kind of lost it on him <laughs> and it seemed like the public was kind of on Ben Affleck's side because Islam had come to a point of being um, a minority that had to be defended in, the, in society's point of view and so some of these new atheists all of a sudden were finding that the public wasn't very open to what the criticisms that they had to have towards Islam 
but even though the public was was very open to these criti same criticisms towards Christianity. So that I think that changed the atmosphere a little bit uh, regarding the new atheists. Um, so you could attack Christianity, but the attack, the same attack on, on Islam is, is not tolerated. So you could, uh, Richard Dawkins was one of the, they have the kind of four horsemen of the new atheists. There's uh, Richard Dawkins, who's a evolutionary biologist, Sam Harris, who I believe is a neuroscientist, um, Chris, Christopher Hitchens, who was uh, very well read um, and wrote editorials, uh, who has died now, and then Daniel Dennett, and Daniel Dennett seems like he, I haven't heard much about him lately. Um, So that Richard Dawkins could say that Christians raising their children in Christianity, that that should be considered child abuse. He, they could say that about Christianity, but when they started saying it about Islam, uh, suddenly it became quite, uh, it was considered intolerant of them to be saying these kinds of things. So it's an interesting kind of kind of thing that, that happened. So the demographic is that they were, they all tended to be white and male and middle class, which, which was an interesting thing to see them, uh, that, that trend within new atheists. They tended to think in terms of modernist terms. They tended to be very optimistic about the world in the sense that in a formal optimism, which is that you believe the world is getting better and that we're taking steps with technology and science and that science and technology will save us. It'll make the world progressively better over time. Uh, Postmodernism tends to be a little more cynical about technology's ability to save us because we also use post, we also use technology to build weapons, um, biological warfare, uh, it can cause ecological disaster. Uh, so those who are in the postmodern way of looking at things might not be so optimistic about the future. But the new atheists tended to be quite optimistic about the use of science and technology to, to make the world a better place. They also tended to not be experts in philosophy or religion. Uh, they committed to quite old enlightenment forms of rationalism, naturalism, materialism. And most of their arguments are pretty recycled from a previous era. Uh, there's a long history of Christian responses to most of what they said. There wasn't really anything new that they were coming up with. What did make what they were doing new was that they were teaching to be blatantly intolerant of religion. So atheism in, in the past did have kind of a, they were interested in debate, but there was kind of a, politeness about it and here the politeness was dropped and there was a willingness to name call and uh, kind of an anger that didn't seem to be present in previous generations of atheists. They were very strong on this idea of secularism that religion's on its way out, that eventually uh, religion will just die away and they were quite forceful in their way of, of speaking. They would sometimes attack people, they would call people fools. Rather than actually talking, attacking the ideas, <laughs> so they would, but um, they, were, they were willing to attack the people as well. Um, they would emphasize the bad of a religion, they'd be very silent on the good of the religion. Uh, they will for example, emphasize the religion of the Islamic State, so ISIS, but they were not willing to look at Stalin's atheism. So the religion of ISIS, their actions came from their worldview, but Stalin's atheistic worldview had nothing to do with his actions. So it seemed like a, a little bit of a simplistic view of the way that worldviews um, affected things. Uh, and it also seemed to be they were picking their evidence. 
and it also seemed like they had a, a simplistic view of God, a kind of a, an old vindictive man in the sky kind of view of God, more of a pagan view of like Zeus more than, than a Christian or monotheistic view of God. So more often than not, they seem to have kind of a, a stereotype view of God, like they found the most ridiculous uh, views and then would be happy to, to make those um, the, the thing that they wanted to attack. So there's a little bit of a paper tiger kind of uh, attack or a straw man. <laughs> um, So they would take these kinds of extreme examples, like Westboro Baptist, ISIS, uh, like Muslim fundamentalists who are associated with violent jihad and associate them with religion in general. And so they have this idea that religion is for the simple-minded. But then, you know, what do you do with someone like Thomas Aquinas? Uh, what do you do with Francis Collins, who's the who had been the head of the Human Genome Project and a very dedicated, faithful Christian? Um, it just seems like too simple. So there were some really good responses to what was being said by the New Atheists. And so the London Review of Books published a review of The, the God Delusion by Richard Dawkins by Terry Eagleton. And I'd like to just read you a couple of paragraphs from his review, and I, th I think it was quite brilliant what he wrote. So this is a quote from Terry Eagleton. Imagine someone holding forth on biology whose only knowledge of the subject is the book of British birds, and you have a rough idea of what it feels like to read Richard Dawkins on theology. Card-carrying rationalists like Dawkins who is the nearest thing to a professional atheist we have since Bertrand Russell, are in one sense the least well equipped to understand what they castigate, since they don't believe there is anything there to be understood, or at least anything worth understanding. This is why they invariably come up with vulgar caricatures of religious faith that would make a first-year theology student wince. The more they detest religion, the more ill-informed their criticisms of it tend to be. If they were asked to pass judgment on phenomenology or the geopolitics of South Asia, they would no doubt bone up on the question as assiduously as they could. When it comes to theology, however, any shoddy old travesty will pass muster. I thought that was uh, pretty brilliant. So, uh, I'm going to read a little bit more. Dawkins considers that all faith is blind faith, and that Christian and Muslim children are brought up to believe unquestioningly. Not even the dim-witted clerics who knocked me about at grammar school thought that. For mainstream Christianity, reason, argument, and honest doubt have always played an integral role in belief, where, given that he invites us at one point to question everything, is Dawkins' own critique of science, objectivity, liberalism, atheism, and the like. Reason, to be sure, doesn't go all the way down for believers, but it doesn't for most sensitive, civilized, non-religious types either. Even Richard Dawkins lives more by faith than by reason. We hold many beliefs that have no unimpeachably rational justification, but are nonetheless reasonable to entertain. So, anyway, that was a very good critique, I thought, that Terry Eagleton wrote about uh, Richard Dawkins' book, uh, The God Delusion. Um, I have a, another thing, just to, before we finish up with the New Atheists. It's, it's worth saying that, so atheism is a worldview as well, and all worldviews have their strengths and their weaknesses. And we just have to be honest about that. Uh, our own worldview has strengths and it has weaknesses. So one of the things that we can do is when they're poking our worldview um, 
we can defend what they're saying about us, but we can also kind of poke back a little bit and say, you know what, your worldview has a couple holes in it too. Um, and sometimes the decision isn't about finding a worldview that has no holes, but it's about finding a worldview with holes that we can live with. Uh, so, Alvin Plantiga is uh, someone who does apologetics, and he wrote something very interesting that uh, I want to share with you about a hole that gets poked into materialist. Uh, materialist just basically means that the material you see in the universe is all there is. There's no spirit. There's nothing outside this universe. What you see is what you get when you die. Your your worm food. There's nothing beyond that. Um, and uh, so, live your life as best you can, but don't don't hold out for something after this. And Alvin Alvin Plantiga said that there, actually there's a hole here as well. So people who are naturalistic or materialistic, they tend to think that they hold truth very highly. And so this is from Simon Smart, who is from the Center for Public Christianity in Australia. Uh, it's worth following that group. They're very good at apologetics. So he's explaining Alvin Plantinga's argument. So I'll just read this piece. The basic idea is this. If you're a naturalist, so there's no God or gods, that's a naturalist, you'll also be a materialist. So materialist is the only thing that exists including consciousness, is physical matter. You'll think human beings are material objects and that there isn't any immaterial soul or self or person. So within uh, materialism or naturalism, the idea of the person as a, a self is a bit of an illusion on the basis of the material that we're made up of. But we're really just like made up of atoms and molecules and it's, there's nothing beyond that. So I'll, I'll continue on with Simon Smart here. You will also necessarily think that any belief that someone might hold, all religion is irrational, for instance, is something like a structure of neurons in the nervous system or in the brain, which will have two kinds of properties. The belief will have a neurophysiological property, but it will also have content properties. Now, evolution doesn't give a toss about what you believe. It only cares about rewarding adaptive behavior and punishing maladaptive behavior. So evolution will modify those neurophysiological properties in the direction of greater adaptiveness. But it doesn't follow that it modifies belief in the direction of truth. Evolution doesn't care about true belief. So what he's saying is that you, ha you might have a belief, but that belief is really just there to help you survive according to a materialist point of view. Right? So it's just neurons. Right? It's not saying anything about truth. It's saying something about, it's trying to help you survive and pass on your genes. So Simon Smart continues on. So, says Plantiga, if you accept the combination of naturalism and materialism, you'll have to take it that for any particular belief you might hold, the, probably, the probability that it's true is about half. It could as likely be true as false. All you really know is that as creatures, we evolve and behave adaptively. If that's the case, given naturalism and evolution, then the probability that one's beliefs are reliable will be low. Now, of course, if you don't accept naturalism and materialism and suspect there's more going on inside you and those you love than mere physical matter, then you don't have that problem. If you think there's more to life than only that which you can see and touch and smell, you have grounds for trusting your faculties. So Plantinga's argument is found in Naturalism Defeated, a, a book that he wrote. It's a very interesting argument. He's saying that 
evolution in your brain, the way that evolution works, it's not there to produce true beliefs. It's there to produce beliefs that help you survive. And so you can't necessarily say that a belief you're holding is true. You're not about truth. You're about survival. If, if you are a materialist or a naturalist, all the thoughts in your head are about survival, not about truth. So it's a, it's an interesting argument. So again, this is just to say that every worldview has holes in it, including ours. And it's worth sometimes pointing that out uh, to someone who's being, who's very happy to point out the holes in your worldview. It's worth sort of saying, well, let's look at the worldview you come from and we'll, we'll see how well that holds up too. And then we can sort of have a, have a discussion about which holes we want to live with. Uh, the next video, we'll, we'll move on to reasons for why we might believe that God exists.